Happy Tuesday, everybody, and depending on where you are, it's either Tuesday morning, Tuesday evening, Tuesday afternoon, or Tuesday night. Um, we will start in about one minute. We'll just see a couple of stragglers come in. We'll uh, do a start at um, one minute past the hour. So a little bit of patience, and then we'll get started. Thank you. All right, it is uh, one minute past the hour. Let's get started with this webinar on safety and security critical software. Uh, my name is Mark Hermeling, and I figured that uh, to start this webinar off, we would turn our cameras on for a little bit, bit and say hi. This is a tough enough time that uh, we don't want everybody just to see slides um, and voices, um, your voices. It's good to see hello and, and, and look people in the eye, even if it's virtually. My name is Mark Hermeling. I'm your moderator and one of the presenters of this webinar today, um, and I'm here with uh, with Marcel. Uh, so I've been uh, I work for Grammatech. Uh, we do application security testing. Uh, I have about uh, 20 years of experience helping a, a variety of customers across different in industries: telecom, industrial, um, medical, automotive, aerospace, and defense. Uh, and uh, I typically help people build better software faster. So I'll talk a little bit today and my experience on, the, on helping people uh, build better software systems and getting more efficiency uh, out of their software development teams, especially in the light of, of functional safety requirements. And Marcel, can you introduce yourself as well, please? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Yeah, thanks for inviting us with this webinar. Um, yeah, I'm Marcel Beemster. I'm the CTO of SolidSense. Uh, we're not so, such a big company uh, based in Amsterdam. And um, yeah, our product is a compiler test suite for C and C++. Um, it's traditionally used widely by, by compiler developers all over the world. But uh, for the past five, past five, six years, it's used more and more uh, in projects that are safety critical, where people want to know for sure that the code is uh, translated correctly. And I'll tell you more about that uh, in uh, 20 minutes, I guess. Excellent. Perfect. Well, thank you, uh, Marcel. Let me figure out how I can share my screen again. And there we go. All right. Um, so I want to talk to you today about safety and security critical systems. And, and Marcel, as I said, will join me, talk to you about uh, how important the compiler is for that entire story. So we'll have uh, about 45 minutes worth of, uh, of slides for you. And then we'll have a question and answer session at the end. Um, so during this presentation, your microphones are all on mute. If you have questions, please find the uh, the question mark on your user interface, and you can press that question mark and submit your question. And you can su submit it during the webinar, uh, but we will wait till the end to answer it because it's really hard to uh, build a good story and at the same time start reading your questions. So don't hesitate to submit during the web webinar, and, and we'll answer them at the end. Of course, this will also be recorded, and you'll receive an email after this webinar uh, with the recording link and you can see this, uh, share that, of course, as well with your colleagues. And lastly, there will be two poll questions as well during this webinar. We'll call them out and we'll ask for your participation to answer the poll questions and we can see uh, how you as an audience are, uh, are doing with regards to the, uh, the, the material presented here. So let me uh, give you a quick heads up as to uh, what we have in store for you here today. So we're talking about software development lifecycle initially. That's what, where my passion lies. My passion is all about helping people set up better processes and better teams to develop software. Because software development is teamwork, and teamwork is hard. If you have safety or security requirements, that only makes it harder, right? because you have to really uh, deliver on your promise of functional safety. I often make the comment that functional safety is all about saying what you do, doing it and I'm proving that you've done what you said you would do. So part of that, of course, is testing. We'll talk a little bit about testing, DevSecOps, shift left, CI, CD, whatever uh, word you want to associate with it. This is really important and this is a massive change 
in how people are doing software development for functional safety. And then Marcel at the end will come in and talk about know your tools, test your compiler, because knowing what your compiler does is really, really important if you build these systems. So your host for this webinar is Solat Sands. Uh, as Marcel said, uh, they are a one-stop shop for C and C++ compiler and library testing and validation and safety services. So it's important to understand that a compiler is a very complex thing, especially as you go up the, uh, the C++ stack and more uh, newer C++ features. And it's not just the compiler, it's also the, the libraries that go with the compiler. And they're based in Amsterdam. They've had some amazing uh, skate weather over the past couple of days. I'm looking at some decent snow here in Ottawa as well. And uh, there's quite some interesting weather patterns passing through the world right now. Um, and then I work for Grammatech. Uh, we've been in the market for quite a few times. Grammatech is a 13-year-old company. And we've been providing application security testing products uh, for about 15-ish years. Uh, we both have static application security testing tools, is what I'll talk about today. Uh, and then we have um, software composition analysis solutions as well, which is a, a completely different angle uh, of application security testing. I won't touch on that today, but you can find more information on our website. And we're all, all over the world. We're very strong in embedded use cases where um, quality matters, right? So automotive, medical, aerospace, and you can see the list there. Uh, lots of different checkers. We'll talk about MISRA, for example, and Cert C and, and those type of standards, but also buffer overruns and uh, security warnings with regards to tainted data and stuff like that. Uh, lots of happy users and, and a big install base. So I want to talk about software development. And when you start software development uh, and you go a little bit back in time, when I started my career, I started with a company called Rational Software. And this is where people were just about switching from waterfall software development, hence this nice picture of a waterfall out of Ithaca, New York. And they were switching from waterfall to iterative. And that was the big thing, right? Rational had a rational unified process and it was all a, a process driven a method of doing modeling and derivations of models and test cases and all that type of good stuff. And uh, and people were just switching from that. And what you saw in, the, in those cases was that roughly software development looks like this, right? You have people, that's really the smarts of a company, and these people develop software, source code, and that software goes into a source code repository, or whatever you were using, and that get, then gets built and that delivers a binary and you you run that through quality and security assessment the test phase and then you get feedback that's the high level flow of software development and that really that high level flow hasn't changed but what i'll talk about here is that how we do this has changed significantly with really big impact so that software development of course as i said it's it's a teamwork exercise right because every developer produces source code and then tests a little bit and submits that code into a repository. And certainly 20 years ago, uh, and, and as much as to 10 years ago, people do a weekly regression test. Like all the code from all the developers comes together, right? Because you had code from multiple different developers. That would come together in this repository. And then every week it was built and regression tested all of the test cases. And especially if you have an embedded use case with lots of um, inputs that have to go in and have to be verified, that can get really, really complicated. It can take a lot of time and a lot of hardware resources. Um, but then after this regression test, you get results, and then you have to react to those results, fix the failing test cases, and, and move on. And as people get better, as there's more automation, as there's more processing power available, that weekly regression test may have turned into a daily regression test. But still, there's lots of work required to get all of that work artifacts into a single build and then to test that build. So some of the challenges with this, of course, is that there's a delay in test results. Developers lose track of their changes. If you uh, provide some form of input on Monday and you don't get a result on how your code has changed and whether the test cases are still passing until the following Monday, that's a full week. You've, been, you've moved on to something else. You've moved on to different things. And if there's a test failure, you have to go back and, and rework it. And that's expensive. That's expensive. And it's frustrating. Um, and then the results are over a set of changes. 
So, um, so it's unclear which change triggered a particular test failure. Um, so how do you how do you deal with that, right? How do you figure out uh, what tests failed and, and and that type of good stuff? Um, and then, of course, as you go on, um, there's no root cause analysis either. So your results are over a set of test cases. And something failed. Test one, two, three failed. Some obscure name test case failed. Uh, now you have to go in and say, okay, I have to debug my change, what has failed, and figure out what the root cause was. It was it a change that I made? Was it a change that somebody else made? Like, what's going on here? So, so this is all challenges of working on larger software development teams collaborating. And uh, and the best practice here, of course, is is to um, keep feedback loops as as quick as, as short as possible, right? So. Minutes, ideally, the quicker that you have uh, a test result back, the quicker that you can have a fix in, the better your code is, the less technical debt that you have. And you want to automate stuff as well. Uh, one of the teams that I've worked with in the past, um, whenever you wanted to do a full regression test, it took three weeks and there was lots of manual labor, manual testers that were involved. That's hard. That means that you will not get your results back, your final regression test results back for three weeks after your change, which is crazy. Crazy long time. Uh, and then the last part here that I want to talk about is how to test every change. But before I go on, I'd like to uh, pull out a little bit of a poll. Um, so Rodney, if you can uh, push the poll out, please. Uh, the poll question, there should be a, a button that shows up in your user interface uh, with the poll question. And I don't see it yet. Um, but the poll question is about how long does it take to, um, how much elapsed time between a code change and test results for your integrated changes in your team? So if you are, if you think about your team and you make a code change, you're a software developer, you make a code change, how long does it take you to get results back? How long does it take you to uh, get test results back and, and, and to be able to assess whether that's the right um, change. So if you go to your right-hand side, there'll be a little poll button. It looks like a little graph, and you can choose one of the answers. The answers I've, I've given here are zero to five, five to 30, less than one day, one to two days, or more than two days. So if you can take a second there, I see some results coming in. Thank you very much. Um, how long does it take you? I was talking to an industrial manufacturing uh, customer two weeks ago uh, in the US. And they said it took them more than 48 hours to get test results back. So they would make it to code change. They would roll it out, that code change. Uh, and then they would do testing. And it would be 48 hours before developers had results back from their testing. And that was really impacting their ability to, uh, to move quickly. All right. I see 13 different answers here. That's pretty good. Let's give it 10 more seconds and see if we can get a few more answers. Five, four, three, two, one, and we can end the poll. So I have 23% that says five to 30 minutes. That's awesome. I have 53% that says less than one day, and 23% says one to two days. So that's uh, that's pretty long, uh, but that's that, that's a good answer. So. One quarter of the people say five to 30 minutes, one quarter says one to two days, and the average seems to be about less than one day. Good. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail if I can. So I have a graph here. This is um, how we can evolve that, that testing um, scenario that I had. So I had the software development use case earlier, that high level overview. This is how we can refine it a little bit with what we call DevSecOps or DevOps, depending on, on where you stand in your naming conventions. And the difference really is that final um, icon to the right-hand side there that says merge on pass. So here you say a developer writes source code and then submits it into a repository. And I've drawn multiple different repositories because every developer works kind of in isolation. And then when the developer is ready, he or she submits that change that change goes into CI CD tooling, so continuous integration, continuous deployment, gets built, 
gets fully tested, all the in integration tests, he, he or she gets feedback on that code change, ideally in minutes. And as I see here, five to 30 minutes, that's a really good time. So 25% of you are already there. That's really good. And then if those if that feedback is correct, if there's no major failure, then the code is merged into the bigger repository uh, and, and we can move on to the next feature. And this means that a lot of those challenges with teamwork uh, are, are removed because now you know that your code works in the larger code base and other people can start building on top of that. The other thing that's really, really cool to think about here is that when you talk about this test workflow, um, you can actually integrate static application security testing in here. And static application security testing, as most of you are probably familiar with, is a way to inspect the code base in a more like mathematical formula, formula as opposed to automated testing. And it, it looks at your code base and it tries to find problems in that code base. And you can do that at that build time, which is awesome. So at that build time, you can perform static application security testing and you will get feedback right away on whether there's anything wrong with your source code, even before you get to the actual test cases, even before you get to the actual functional dynamic test cases. So let's look at that feedback and let's um, kind of investigate what type of feedback you can get back. So what it gives you is that it finds you problems before testing. So before you even get to that automated test case, you get feedback from static application security testing. And every problem that it gives you has a full root cause analysis. And I have a slide uh, in, in coming up right after this one that gives you an example. So it doesn't just tell you, hey, there's something wrong here, right? Which is what testing would give you. It says, hey, this test case has failed. Um, but it tells you there's something wrong here, and this is the path that I've evaluated as a tool that says why this is wrong. And what's really important to realize as well is that it finds problems that dynamic testing does not find. So dynamic testing is all about writing down test cases that will drive your application through a specific set of execution paths. Static application security testing on the other side tries to analyze all paths through an application. And that's a tall order because there's many, many different paths. And if you understand program flow and while loops and decision points, you quickly realize that that's a hard thing to do. But it tries to analyze all paths through the application, which is way more than dynamic testing can, can achieve, even if you have full MCDC. And it uh, analyzes coding standard violations to it. Slide here says fixes. That's a little bit of a, of a strong word. But it, it finds violations to coding standards. And coding standards are something that people that build that that build functional safety software are very familiar with because it's a requirement, right? You have to uh, define your coding standard and adhere to the coding standard. Well, static analysis will tell you right away as you write your source code where you're violating that coding standard. So let's uh, let's have a look at, at an example here. This is a, a screen snapshot that we often use uh, to give you an idea as to the type of information that static application security testing can give. So in this case, it's not actually as much of a coding standard violation, right? It's, it's, a, um, it's a problem with buffer handling. Now, your coding standards will say, make sure that your buffer handling doesn't have any problems. But finding these type of problems requires really deep analysis of the source code and the execution of the program. And in this case, the static analysis tool has found that on line 2224 uh, of your program here, there is a malloc. And for people that are familiar with C, um, you can evaluate this for a little bit, but that last bracket that's before the plus one is in the wrong spot. So as opposed to allocating enough space to hold string, the length of string S plus one, you've allocated enough space to hold the length of string S, and then you, you went one inside of that buffer. So this creates a buffer overrun when you do the, uh, the string copy at 2225 later. So you have a buffer overrun that's created here. This is not something that a dynamic test tool will find. This is something that you may find later when you run your program and it crashes or you get results back that you had not expected. So dynamic testing will not find these type of things. 
Uh, these are the type of things that exactly why you do static application security testing. Another example is something that we ran into with a customer a while ago. This customer was building a self-driving car and they had a buffer overrun, a really big buffer overrun in an error handling function. And that error handling function was not being actively tested because it was really hard to get to that particular problem. And, and when you do embedded systems, especially functional safety systems, you often have these type of things. So in this case, um, our tool code Sonar found that problem and that big buffer overrun was basically wiping memory. And that would have caused a crash. And with self-driving cars on the road doing millions of hours, the likelihood of that problem actually being hit, right? that error handling function is there for a reason. If that error happened, then that car would have crashed, literally. So static analysis covers more path than dynamic analysis. So how does this relate then to functional safety? Well, what we've seen over the past while is that more and more people uh, are going to this DevSecOps Dev, um, workflow. And you saw that in the poll as well, right? If you one quarter of the people get full regression testing results in five to 30 minutes, that is a tremendous advantage for any software development team. Or right? if you can have a code change, uh, you've made a change, you've implemented a feature as a developer, you submit the feature, and within 30 minutes, you get a result. So you go get a cup of coffee, you take a break, you come back, and you see whether your feature was accepted and whether it actually fits in the rest of the software. You can now take the mental switch and go on to your next feature. That's awesome, right? If you compare that to other people, um, I see one to two days, that's also about 25%, 20%. If, if you get that feedback two days later, now you have to take a mental shift because you've moved on to something else. That's really, a, really expensive. So people are moving to those DevSecOps workflows and uh, static analysis, static application security testing helps you adhere to your coding standard, which you are required to do, but it goes way beyond that, right? It, it allows you to do deep scanning and, and find more defects that are related to um, buffer overruns and things like that. So this connects really well with people that build um, software that have functional safety and, and or security requirements. So coding standard validation and deep scanning uh, for, for defects. So if you have anything with regards to ISO 26262, IEC 6158, DO178, Senelec, uh, those type of standards, um, going to that DevSecOps workflow and integrating static application security testing is a really, really, really strong enabler for your teams. So that's kind of the, the, the story that I wanted to leave with you today. So DevSecOps and adding static analysis into that CI CD tooling in that, into that workflow, getting the results back, it's very, very well possible for functional safety related software development cases. If you're interested, uh, reach out afterwards. We're can certainly help you get there. Uh, if you have any questions about this part of the presentation, uh, feel free to send them in through the little question mark. I see a couple of questions already, so that's wonderful. Uh, so um, feel free to submit some questions and I will pass it over to Marcel, who will talk a little bit more about how that CICD tooling, that, that build part uses a compiler, the compiler in, uh, creates a binary. And of course, that's a really important part of your, uh, of your software aspect. So Marcel will take it from here. And, and talk about how to make sure that that compiler fits in, in your use cases. Over to you, Marcel. I have a feeling that we lost Marcel. Please stay with us as we try to find out what the uh, the challenge is here. Monica, are you hear anything from Marcel? We 
were joking a little bit earlier that there's lots of weather issues in various different places and Rodney was afraid that he was going to lose connectivity. But I think we lost connectivity with Marcel. I see that Marcel just popped up again in our online chat. So I think he should be back in a minute. All right. Um, let's, he uh, might have some internet connection problems. Okay. So while we wait for Marcel, like there's a really good question that I can uh, tackle in the meantime. Uh, it's about one of my statements. I love people uh, questioning me about my statements. Um, so the question here is about SAS finds problems before testing. This strikes me as unusual. The normal mantra is that static techniques are more expensive in many ways than testing techniques. So does it want typically leave static analysis for the tricky bugs that testing did not find, such as concurrency errors? Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a valid statement. So, so dynamic testing is something that takes time because you have to go, run through thousands and thousands of test cases, right? Uh, and static analysis is, is compute intensive. And here comes Marcel. We'll give him a, a minute to get settled. Um, so static analysis is, uh, is compute intensive. So my statement is always you can find problem before testing. Uh, as you write source code, um, you can do that right away. You don't need input, for example. You don't need a dynamic test case to do static analysis. Uh, you can really do it quickly at any point during your, uh, uh, your software development process. But yes, uh, static techniques do involve more compute power. But there's, you also have to realize there's different types of static analysis. There's static analysis with regards to like buffer overruns, they, they take a bit of compute power. But especially if you go towards concurrency, which is what the question uh, was about, that takes a lot more compute power. So yes, so maybe you do a split between static analysis quickly early on in the cycle, and then um, the deeper ones, the concurrency, you can take longer to, uh, to do the compute on. All right, Marcel, uh, welcome back. Uh, if yeah, you thank are, you, Mark. If, you, if you're good to go, take it away. My computer decided to crash, so <laughs> that was interesting. Uh, but I'm back, so uh, let me show you my screen. Here we go. Excellent. All right. No, nope, that's not my screen. It's one of them. Yeah, it's one of them. Right one. Right it again. Hmm. Open the presentation again. So while Marcel does that, again, feel free to answer, uh, put more questions in there. Um, always happy to uh, find more time at the end of this presentation to answer the rest of your questions. Hmm, it's moving away when I open it. That is strange too. Um, I'll just show it in a little bit different format. Thank you for your patience, everybody. You can yep, see sorry this about is that. A, this is a live presentation. Right. OK. Yes, now we can, now see, can see my screen. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, I want to continue with uh, the waterfall metaphor. Uh, and in this case, this is often the state that we find our customers in, uh, our future customers in when they start talking to us. Because, um, yeah, um, they've worked on their program. They've worked on their source code. They've done a lot of testing. Uh, but at some point, it's time to uh, to roll out stuff, and uh, then the deadline is approaching, as you see here. And uh, then you jump over the waterfall, and you don't look actually at what the compiler uh, is really doing. So basically, people trust their compiler, and there are good reasons for trusting the compiler because compilers are very mature and very reliable. But they're also extremely complex pieces of software, so there can be little things that do go wrong. And instead of just taking the plunge like uh, this guy does, you may want to know what's actually going on. Um, you may even have to know what's going on because you may be working on a safety critical project. And then there are rules for safety critical software uh, standards for that. 
And if you want to abide by those standards, then it's better to take a look at what your compiler is doing. Right, now what can possibly uh, go wrong in a compiler? Now, this is uh, an error that we found uh, in a compiler for uh, quite a popular compiler for embedded target. So it's not a widely used compiler such as, as GCC for x86 or LLVM for x86, which are used in hundreds of thousands of compiles every day. But this is for an embedded target for a relatively small uh, audience. And this compiler really contains very bad errors. This was not the only one. But in this case, uh, the problem with this compiler was that here we have an assignment to uh, a value in an array. The compiler recognized that, okay, this assignment here, this, this array was, this array location was used here as well. So the compiler thought, well, let's propagate this value. I can directly use this value 42 and uh, substitute it in the if statement. And so that the compiler thought is always true. However, the compiler did not take into account that this pointer assignment may sometimes be an alias of S0, and then uh, S0 would no longer have the value of 42, and, uh, well, things would go wrong. Now, this, this, uh, this can happen. I mean, if you have some, uh, maybe a rotating buffer, uh, a bounded buffer in, in a rotating space, um, where at some point you have a pointer that points to the begin or the end of the buffer and you're writing to the begin of the end of the buffer, uh, this can really be a bad case. And it may also be an exceptional case. So you may not find it in your normal testing. So this compiler, it, it's really bad. Uh, we had to advise the customer not to use this compiler, um, but that in if you're at the very end of your project, that's not so uh, easy to switch to another compiler. Now, normally it's not so bad. So this is um, a more uh, generic compiler. Uh, this is a GCC for x86 target. It's, it's uh, uh, 7.3, they're maybe a level 10 these days, but that doesn't matter much. The results are very similar between uh, the, the old time GCC 7 and the current day GCC implementation. Um, and what we find here is the report that we get out of SuperTest. So we see here that we actually, SuperTest has found 81 language failures, 93 test cases that need to be checked manually, 22 errors in the library handling. And that, that sounds like a lot. And uh, yeah, it is it's relatively much, of course. Um, but many of these errors are mitigatable. And that means that there are ways to get around these errors. And this is what you get with GCC out of the box. If you add uh, more strict uh, options, and more strict diagnostic options, you can reduce this amount of errors by a great deal. And that makes the GCC compiler much more compliant with the C language that it's pretending to compile. So these kind of errors, they, they're quantitatively, they're quite a lot but there are ways to work around this and a way to fix that. And uh, these are things that you want to know when you work on safety critical software. We see also four runtime failures here below. Um, they, those have to do with very specific language syntactical constructs. And yeah, they are really errors. Uh, they, they're really in bad implementations of the language. But if you know about them there, then you can avoid them because this is for particular language features that can be avoided and that you don't need to use in your program. And you want to know about that. Now, this talk is about, about quality, safety, security. Um, how do they relate to each other? Now, first of all, uh, yeah, quality, how do you reach quality? That, that's a matter of good software engineering. Uh, when it comes to safety, functional safety, then in addition to software engineering, there are uh, standards that have been developed over uh, long periods of time. I'll show you that in a moment. And those standards give you practical advice of how you have to uh, look at your software, what you have to verify in your software to achieve better safety, better functional safety of your software. Uh, for security, you basically have to do everything that you do for quality and safety as well, but there are additional guidelines and additional rules. Now, security in, in electronics is a relatively new field when it compares to functional safety. 
So the guidelines for security are often not so um, not so practical in the way they are used as the, as the functional safety guidelines. So in the rest of my talk, I will mainly focus about functional safety, but keep in mind that everything for functional safety is also good for security. And we see that with the MISA standard that has been adapted, uh, augmented with an additional number of rules specifically for security, but they say, okay, these are additional. You also have to do everything that you do for safety. Now, security rules are often not so tangible as uh, functional safety guidelines. For example, if you look on the website, what are security guidelines for Python? And then you get a list of 10 guidelines and nothing there is specific for Python. For Python. They're not verifiable by, by static analysis checkers. They, are, uh, they contain guidelines such as reduce your attack service. Now that is a very good advice, of course, but it's not something that you can automatically check and automatically develop. So that requires a lot of uh, yeah, background knowledge and, and intuition and, and, and experience to implement those kind of things. For safety, there are often processes that you can follow. And that's a very good thing about functional safety. Functional safety uh, stems from the area of, of uh, steam locomotives, uh, the Industrial Revolution, when People in Germany in particular thought, okay, well, this may not be good if we allow uh, these locomotives to explode at random places. So they thought about how can we build functional safety into our machines? And the result of that now more than 170 years of experience with functional safety has given us good guidelines, good processes to deal with functional safety. And they're not in terms of uh, exactly what you have to do. So for this, this boiler that exploded in this locomotive here, you could say, okay, instead of one safety valve, you have to have two safety valves on the, on the, uh, on the boiler. That might be a security guideline, but that is not the way security guidelines have developed. developed. The, the security guidelines, they start with the end uh, of what can happen. They, they ask you to think about, okay, how can your uh, contraption component machine possibly harm people and then you have to think backward what can you do to prevent people getting harmed and that means that there's not a specific guideline you have to add a second safety valve to the boiler but it allows you freedom to find solutions that are fit for the purpose that you need um, yeah, talking about safety, uh, this is a good place for the poll. Uh, Rodney, can you bring up the, the second poll? Because that asks a little bit about uh, the background. Uh, what is your background uh, in terms of safety or security or not at all? Uh, thinking about um, compilers, um, thinking about what can possibly go wrong uh, in a compiler, then you can see that uh, well, suppose that we have a piece of software, uh, C scores source code that controls uh, the brake uh, of the car and the brakes of the car. And that source code is, is perfect, that's flawless, but all of that source code has to be compiled by this compiler. And a tiny little uh, bug in that compiler can have an arbitrary effect on the uh, generated, um, generated software, generated software target code for that car. And then basically anything can go wrong with that brake, uh, brake system in the car. It can just stop braking, it can brake at arbitrary uh, places. And that's clearly a very uh, big potential impact. So the impact of a malfunction of the compiler can be arbitrarily large because the software that we allow to control the car is, is so, ubiquitous and so much in control of the safety features of the car, that is very dangerous if things go wrong there. Um, compiler qualification, and that's where we get to, okay, what can we do about uh, making uh, it, it safe to use this compiler? Then we get to what's called compiler qualification. We want to assess the compiler and to see whether uh, this possible impact can really pan out. And if that is indeed possible, then we want to do something about it. Um, now, compiler qualification may seem like a daunting task because compilers are very complicated pieces of software. And in order to do the compiler qualification and verification, 
uh, yeah, you have to step a little bit outside of your product and you may not be comfortable with that. But with this talk, I hope to help you uh, and make that very big elephant into a much smaller mouse. Although if I see my scale now, this rodent is rather large compared to the car. So maybe it should have been a smaller mouse. Um, but I'm going to try to tell you that compiler qualification can indeed be managed. Okay, let me see. Let's see what we've got for the poll. I'm going to close the poll in uh, 10 seconds. So I give you 10 more seconds because, before we go to the next part of the talk. Um, let's see if the results are ready. Here we have. Okay. Um, the question was, are you working on safety critical software? 60% says, yes, I am. 10% says, expecting to do that in the future. 30% says, no, my primary interest is in security. And there are 0% for the other two cases, software quality and anything else. So yeah, most of you, 63% uh, I've got now in, in uh, uh, safety critical software plus another 10% for uh, to do that in the in the working on that in the future okay what means compiler qualification in the context of functional safety so the goal of compiler qualification is to develop enough confidence in the use of the compiler so that uh, you can indeed use it uh, with the potential impact that it has and you want to do that you want to develop that com confidence for a very specific use case so you want to to deal with that on a project specific basis. And you want to do that by verification against the language specification. And if you find errors in that verification and you're actually, you're bound to find errors, we've never met a compiler that is 100% conforming. Um, you need to know about those problems that you find in the, in, the, um, in the compiler and you need to mitigate those, uh, those failures. And that is often, that is doable. That, that is often uh, the case that it has to deal with a specific use of the compiler or with its library or whatever, and you can avoid that, but you want to know about that. Now the use case, that's the first part, that is important because uh, it very much depends on how you use that compiler and the way you use that compiler may not have been verified by the manufacturer, by the, with the, by the producer, by the developer of the compiler. Um, here is an example of that. This is a use case, where's my screen? This is a use case where we use um, a Linux compiler uh, that was built for Linux. And we use that compiler in combination with Windows on the Linux subsystem for Windows. So the Linux subsystem for Windows allows you to run Linux programs on a Windows computer. And that, that works almost flawlessly. But in this case, what we have here, this, these statements over here, we have a long double variable. We load it with the variable 1.3, uh, just a small constant. And then in the assert statement, we add to the, uh, the constant a small epsilon value, and we expect the result to be at least, at least as large as LDVAR, the original value 1.3. Now, this fails. Um, if you compile this program, with a Linux compiler on a uh, Windows machine for x86, and then try to run it on that machine. And that fails because the floating point model of Linux is different from the floating point model of Windows. So the compiler, uh, it's a Linux compiler, it's a perfect compiler for, for Linux, and it knows about the data model for Linux. Windows is, of course, also fine by itself because um, because Linux uh, Windows is defined with a certain floating point model and that's all consistent. But you, if you combine these two cases, and there may be reasons that you want to combine these two cases, it fails and that use case will not be in anybody's test suite and whatever. This error has been in the Linux subsystem for Windows since we discovered it in, uh, I think, 2017 or 18 or something when the first uh, betas of Linux system came out, subsystem came out. It's still there, uh, it's not fixed. Um, so in the functional, um, functional safety uh, standards, uh, we're looking now in particular to the automotive functional safety standard, ISO 26262. There are 
uh, sections in that those statements, those standards also in the others for industrial, for uh, for uh, nuclear, for for aviation, there are um, parts in those functional safety standards that deal with the confidence in the use of software tools. And this is uh, the qualification process that comes out of uh, ISO 26262. So it is basically five steps. ISO 26262 is nice because it um, gives a very nice process. You can follow that process. These are steps that you can follow. It's not an elephant. These are steps that you can actually implement and go through. Uh, it starts with planning of the users. So that means co collecting all the information about the compiler and how you use it. Tool evaluation, that is figuring out if actually the impact of the compiler can be as big as, as you uh, may have it. Um, or maybe you find out that the impact is not so big and then you can skip it. Then it provides you with uh, option of what kind of qualification methods that you can use. And based on that, you can provide the validation of the compiler, the verification of the software and the possible mitigating actions. And then you have to wrap it all up if you want to, um, yeah, if you want to uh, uh, show this to an external assessor, a software um, safety assessor, then you want to document and, and let this be reviewed, of course. Now, these steps are all explained and uh, they are all doable. That, that's not rocket science. Tool evaluation takes into account the tool impact. We discussed that already. What is the potential impact of a functional failure of the compiler? And the tool error detection. If there is something wrong in that compiler, what is the chance, what is the likelihood that you find that something went wrong in the, in the compiler? Now you have to take these two into account and then go through this data flow schedule and then you figure out either you don't have to do any further verification of your tool or you figure out that you have to pick one of the possible qualification methods. Now out of those qualification methods for compilers, only validation of the compiler, verification with the test suite, is a practical one. So we look a little bit into that. And that requires that you um, do the valid validation of the tool by testing. And for that, you need uh, a test suite, a good test suite for, uh, for, for uh, checking that compliance uh, with the specification of the C language. And you do that given the specific use case. So given the options that you're using, given the platform that you're using, given the target process that you're using. Um, you measure both compliance and also what the compiler does if things go wrong. So if there are ill-formed programs, what is the reaction to the compiler on ill-formed programs? That also is defined in the language specification where many cases require, if you write uh, incorrect syntax, then you should, the compiler should provide diagnostics for that. Uh, but in some cases, there's undefined behavior and that is not required to be uh, diagnosed. For that, we have to rely on the static checkers that uh, Mark was explaining about. And then if we find errors that can be both compliance errors, runtime errors and diagnostic errors, we have to define mitigation. We have to define workarounds for those malfunctions in the tool. Now to show compliance with, with the specification of the, of the language, uh, we can see that according to the V model here, uh, where sort of in the middle of the, this is for the compiler development, in the middle of the compiler development, we have the language definition. We have the definition of what the compiler is about to compile, it, how to, it has to compile it. And then we have our test suite, that's a solid sense, super test, test, suite, test suite for C and C++. And that is built according to the language specification. And of course, also a lot of experience about other things can, that can go wrong in the compiler. And it provides all of the tests, but those tests can all be traced back to the language specification. So the, the tests there have a, a grounding in the language definition. And that's how we know that they are fit for validating of the compiler. Supertest fundamentally is just a huge collection of, uh, of tests. Many of them are handwritten. So, so we have a very large body of handwritten tests. The axis here, that, that those represent the diagnostic test. But we also have a couple of generators. And basically with generators, you can 
generate arbitrary many tests, as many as you want for specific fields that you want to, uh, to validate. Supertest, in, in a nutshell, we have um, our basic test suite is for the C language, for the C language test suite. And additional to that, we have the library test suite. So those are different purposes of, of validation, validating the library, the standard library that comes with the compiler, or validating the compiler itself. And we have the same for C++ as well. Uh, we also have some test suites for um, MISA checkers. So uh, those validate that the MISA checker that you use is doing the right thing because the MISA checker itself can also be a safety critical tool. If, if the MISA checker does not find certain errors in your software, that can also lead to uh, uh, impact uh, of the safety of the, the application. And we're working on uh, a C++ library safety package that, that shows precise uh, coverage of all the tests with the requirements of the language definition. Um, yeah, small overview of, of Supertest. I'm not going into detail. You can find all this information also on our website. So if you're more interested in that, please visit there. And if you then have specific questions, please contact us. Um, Supertest also runs on very small targets. So if you have a small, very small bar, board uh, where, where you have very limited uh, instruction memory, we, we actually uh, use as a reference, we use a platform that has only four kilo, kilobytes of RAM and two kilobytes of data memory. And we make sure that our test can run on that. And that's not true for every test set. Um, most test sets do not take this, this kind of limitation of the target resources into account and they do are, require much bigger uh, resources at the, the target processor. Um, yeah, one final error. Uh, I'm going to skip that actually because uh, uh, time is progressing. But this is an error that we found uh, with our optimization uh, test suite in the Intel ICC compiler. It's, it's a very well known compiler if you want to get the last drop of uh, execution speed out of your Intel processor, you would use that compiler. And it's very good at, at uh, vectorizing and, and optimizing code. But uh, yeah, this is an error that we found in that compiler and it results in a runtime segmentation fault at uh, the second optimization level. And this is something you want to know about. And so you can avoid when this happened because this is also happening under particular circumstances. So some benefits of, of compiler testing and testing and, and qualification, uh, besides just checking the box of this is what we are required to do because it, the, the, the functional safety standard says so. Well, first of all, it will make you sleep better because you know you have done your best to avoid any problems in the compiler. And uh, there are problems in the compiler. Every pro compiler that we know of has some issues that you want to know about. It also decouples uh, application development from compiler testing. You don't have to wait with compiler testing until you almost hit your deadline. You can start a lot earlier with that. And you can even reduce your time to market by taking compiler confidence testing out of your application development by taking it separate from that. And it also provides you with a lot of flexibility if you do your compiler validation and qualification in-house you can change the configuration easily and you, you can change uh, to use new options if you want that. And within 24 hours, you have an answer for your application developers. Yes, it is safe to change to this new configuration of your compiler. So with that, I want to uh, end my part of the presentation. Thank you for your uh, interest. And uh, let's go back to Mark. Are you there? Hey. Yes. yes, I'm here. I just have to. Let me stop my just... sharing. Yes. Thank you. You stop. I start. Look at this go. All right. So this is a great time to uh, to submit your last questions. There's a couple of questions in here that we'll uh, we'll review in a second. Uh, but from a summary perspective, uh, we really talked about two different uh, parts: uh, static application security testing. Right, this is really on your code. It's focused on your code, help make your code better. And, and, and Supertest helps you understand your compiler, right? Make your compiler usage better. 
So it's really interesting to see that static application security testing and, and, and super test, they're not necessarily directly connected. There's some overlap, but they talk such upon a whole bunch of um, topics that are really important for people. So Marcel mentioned the MISRA test. We actually use the MISRA test to uh, to test um, our MISRA compliance, right? There's, there's lots of cross uh, connectivity there. All right, so let's uh, let's go to some questions. Uh, we'll try to get through as many as we can. Uh, our contact details are also here. Uh, you see our email. Uh, you can reach out to us at uh, at LinkedIn and or Twitter. Um, we we love to hear from from people, and we love to help you uh, make your projects successful. Uh, so the first question um, uh, I think is for me. Uh, the question here is. Um, is DevSecOps compatible with high levels of functional safety, such as ISO 26262 to the highest level? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, and the answer is absolutely yes. DevSecOps is a process, right? It's a, it's a methodology of doing work. And um, it's all about how you apply that, how you document it. Uh, and I've worked myself with customers that have, young, uh, have been very successful in going to both automotive as well as industrial and even aviation uh, work cases, uh, certification cases, with these type of new fangled, if you wish, processes. So absolutely, it's compatible, uh, and it's it's actually very nice to come to be able to to quickly change things in your applications and run them through a full set of testing quickly. So yes, that does not stop you. Uh, just go through your normal process of documenting. Uh, your processes and executing those processes. That's that's all fine. Um, so maybe this was an interesting one for you, uh, Marcel. How is super test different from test suites already bundled in GCC or Clang? That must be a question that you get more often than not. Yeah, and it's actually so um, so so current that we uh, are very soon um, publishing a blog about this because uh, we we do get this question and. Uh, the answer is really that it's it's very different uh, because basically uh, those test suites are regression suites for the compilers. And of course, regression suites are very important to provide stability and, and provide you with not falling into uh, existing errors. But um, those test suites do not show any compliance with the language standard because there's no cross-referencing between the language standards and, and those test suites. So you, that if you take the GCC uh, test suite, and we've done that, we've, we've looked at that and, and see what can we learn from this, um, you will not find the completeness of, of that test suite. Uh, so you cannot find out if you want to know, are all the requirements of, of C, C++ 14, are they met? by the GCC compiler, uh, that's not there because uh, uh, they're not indexed and not not um, yeah not, not not organized like that. It's a, it's a reg reg regression suite. And uh, another issue with those suites is that you can't take the GCC suite and, for example, use it to verify another compiler. Uh, they're very much uh, basically at the unit testing level of, of the compiler, and they're very important for the stability of the compiler but they cannot be used to show compliance with uh, the language standard. And so they cannot be used to do this kind of qualification for um, safety critical uh, um, pro projects. Excellent. That's a very uh, elaborate answer. Uh, here is one that uh, actually connected to one of your slides with regards to uh, the Windows subservient. Uh, for Linux, system. yes. Yeah, yeah. thank you. So can yeah, you the, take that question? Yeah, the question is, does it still exist in Windows Subsystem for Linux uh, version 2? Because that is a virtual machine. I don't know. We haven't checked that. Uh, it still exists in the WSL1. And as far as I understand, those two systems, it's not that that number two really replaces number one. You, you can still use both. Uh, but indeed, um, if this is a virtual machine, what should happen is that the floating point processor state should really be uh, completely uh, turned around by the virtual machine and, and set into Linux mode. But we haven't tried that yet. So it, it's something that we are going to do real soon now. Excellent. That's good to know. Thank you. Uh, here's a question around super test and a comp cert C compiler. Right. 
yeah, CompCert is a, is a, a compiler that's proven to be correct. And that's that's very interesting because uh, yeah, there's a huge piece of work. Um, it's it's even a commercial product now. You can buy the CompCert compiler. We have done a validation of the CompCert compiler, and then well, uh, we find issues because CompCert does not implement everything in C. So we find, of course, where uh, CompCert does not implement certain features of C. But when we did this, we also found an error in the in the CompCert compiler, and actually a quite a serious compiler that had to do with the scoping of variables. Now, how can that possibly be? Because this compiler is proven to be correct. Well, actually, if you look into the documentation of CompCert, the part that's proven correct is a very large part of the compiler, but not everything in there is, is, is proven correct. So there are parts that are not uh not actually proven to be correct and in this case the error came actually from the, the the translation from the language which is a written language and and the interpretation of that written language in the program and that of course is always uh something that that is not formally you cannot formally prove what written language is supposed to do so that is always a tricky issue and for that reason um, yeah, testing will always have uh, a reason to be around, even if you think, okay, this is completely proven to be correct. You still need to um, look very carefully at, uh, at the way the, the written specification is translated into something uh, that is verifiable and something that can be machine manipulated. Cool. Excellent. Thank you for that answer. I'm going to connect with that a little bit as well. Uh, we get this question from our site um, frequently as well, not around necessarily about the correctness of the compiler, of course, but around can you support this and this compiler? And um, while I'm not familiar with the CompCert compiler uh, myself, um, from our perspective, static analysis observes the compiler. Um, so we observe how the compiler operates and we interpret how the compiler operates, so the compiler flags uh, and then and then we do the analysis the same way the compiler interprets the source code, including includes and defines and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, even with CompCert, you would be able to use static analysis and fold that around it. Very, very cool. All right, so there's two more questions. We're going to go over a little bit. I think we'll we'll go maybe five minutes over uh, and then uh, and then we'll uh, we'll call it quits. If any more questions, uh, we'll be happy to answer by email afterwards. Uh, so both are for you, Marcel. Uh, the first one is Supertest itself somehow qualified to? Um, not in the sense that we have uh, a certificate that we can can put on on, uh, on, uh, on Supertest from an external uh, party, from a two, for example. Uh, but we do, uh, of course, take care of, of, of uh, the correctness of Supertest itself. And we have our reasoning and we have our explanation of why it is safe to use Supertest. First of all, uh, the most of the IP of Supertest is this very big collection of, of tests. And each test itself is cross-referenced with the language standard and with the definition of what the test should look like. So the test itself, those tests are not tools in the, in the, in the sense of software that does something. Those tests are directly linked to the, the, the source language specification. And secondly, for our tools that we do have, and the two main tools are the compiler driver, sorry, yeah, the, the test driver and the, uh, the report generator. For those tools we actually have, for each of those, we have two independent and completely redundant implementations. And so we can cross-reference those two implementations with each other, and that provides us with additional confidence that those tools are also correctly uh, um, correctly implemented. So we provide that reasoning of, of why Supertest can be uh, uh, used safely as well. Excellent, that sounds very elegant. Uh, and then the last question, uh, this is a, a longer question, it has to do with cross-platform reproducible code. So do you do platform-dependent compiler testing, same compiler, producing different executables on different platforms? Um, so, chip, 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 chip. Question sort of aims at producing cross-platform reproducible code. Uh, yeah, as, as I stated, um, 
we do our testing for a specific use case. So, so Supertest itself is platform independent and, and compiler independent and target independent. So our tests are compiled by a compiler for a particular uh, target platform. And then we execute the test. Every test is self-checking and the test then tells you uh, yes or no, this, this test was executed correctly on that, uh, on that platform. So we always do our use, our, our testing for that specific use case. And um, the same, so the question is the same compiler might produce different executables on different target platforms, I think. Or do you support users test result with a set of launch? No, no, no. We 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 do our testing always specific to a, a specific use case. And if you test right. the compiler for one specific use case, it it basically does not say much about another use case. If you turn on optimizations or turn off optimizations, it's a different use case, and you really have to look again at the safety, the confidence of the compiler that you have for that other use case. Yep. Okay, that makes sense. Well, thank you very much, Marcel. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. This is the end thank of the you, webinar. Mark. Yes. And uh, have a great day. Thank you. Bye bye.